to the long and short of it. I am your host, Jennifer Wren, and this is episode five. Five, five. I, 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 in my mind, I'm like, Johnny Five is alive. I can't believe that we have made it this far. You have been with us for five weeks. We have had so much fun. That's going to be five incredible single malts, five incredible wine pairings from the Elevage collection. And here we are. So I decided to go a little wild tonight and we're, and we're the, the, the leopard um, because we're fast and furious this evening. And uh, I always like to say at the beginning of the show, just a reminder that I am the short shot of single malt whiskey. And I am joined by my ever charming, ever present colleague and dear friend, advanced sommelier, uh, Beth Hickey, who is the long, long pour of wine. And I'm going to go ahead and bring Beth on tonight. Um, we are both going through some crazy stuff right now. Hi, Beth. Hold on. There you are. Oh, I see you. I had to unmute myself. <laughs> uh, yes. So as you can see, I'm at the Bronchia Estate in Tuscany. Um, I'm moving this weekend. Not to there. Um, sadly, that would be amazing. But yes, there is much, much afoot this weekend. So yes, I am also in the process of moving. We have a lot going on in our yep. personal lives also with like in the pandemic. It's just like, man, this year has just been like being shot out of a rocket. But I mean, I have to tell you, I'm always so jealous because I'm just here in the long and short of its studio. And every time I see you, you're in a beautiful vineyard. It's it's like world traveler. Um, but I, I'm so excited to hear about this tonight because this particular wine has one of the most interesting, I mean, last so last week we had a killer label, but this too is a killer label. And, uh, and so I want to hear a little bit more about that when we get to it. But but other than that, how are you doing? How is Seattle going? You guys have had some big rain recently, right? Because last time I talked to you, it was pouring. Yes, actually, uh, we had a huge rainstorm. The <sighs> trees were falling down, huge wind. Um, it was, it's been exciting, but it's actually, it's perfect fall weather, scotch weather, um, bronchia weather. Uh, so it's, it's, it's been entertaining, we'll say. Well, have you ever heard the term Han Solo season? Yes, and yes. I have seen I have seen the vest, the the tight jeans, and the boots. Yes, and it, and I keep wishing for the Mandalorian to come back, you know, because I'm kind of I'm kind of missing it. But uh, yeah, I mean, I've been a little sad. I'm gonna fix that curl. There we go. There we go. Um, because I have this gorgeous wardrobe that I that I hold on to mm -hmm. to always come up and visit you in Seattle, and I actually put on one of those dresses tonight. It's a long sleeve long dress. Because I was like, this was the last, this is, I feel like this is like, the, it's the last one. Beth. No, but it's, it's, this is the dress I was wearing the last time I saw you when it I is. taught the single malt and cherry class. Um, yes. And I, and you were wearing some fabulous, like vintage Coco Chanel. You look fabulous. Oh, um, yeah, you always look so good. So tonight you, you, earlier you said you just threw something on. Is there anything specific about this particular beautiful top that you're wearing? Um, it's actually a complete dress. It's hard to tell, but it is, uh, uh, it's from the twenties. It's velvet. It, um, I, I paired it with the portwood, um, because it's kind of, it's, it's port colored and it's fantastic and it's comfortable and I just threw it on. Um, it is port colored. And I think, you know, for those of you who tuned in last week, I, um, at the very end of our show, I knocked an entire wine glass on my shirt, but the, but the joy of it was I was wearing a port colored shirt. So shirt has been saved, it is, it is salvaged. Um, but there's a gag, you know, Beth, uh, as an advanced sob, do you know the old adage that you can take red wine out with white wine? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it like so you know it can it can kind of work on a light colored fabric. So I was like there was a vague just a vague stain. Like it wasn't terrible, just a like vague stain. Uh -huh. So I decided to take some some white cooking wine that John had in the uh, in the kitchen and just dunk it, like dunk the shirt. And as I'm I'm pulling the cork out to pour the wine on the shirt, I poured it all over myself again. <laughs> and I was like Mercury retrograde. <laughs> yep. and, and 2020. So you and know. 2020. Mm -hmm. Um but fortunately white wine obviously doesn't stain. So I am so excited tonight mm -hmm. about our guest. Me too. I mean, it's going to be fun. And the, the joke here on the long and short of it is that our long, tall, poor Beth has been bringing, honestly, to the table the lion's share of many of our guests. So, so there's been a huge Seattle contingency. But tonight, LA, the Angelinos are showing up. La La Land is here. And... Uh, 
The gentleman who's joining us tonight has been my friend, oh my goodness, five years, five and a half years at this point. Um, we met in the whiskey world and it's such a gift to uh, introduce him to you, Beth, because I was just like, they're going to get along like gangbusters. They're going to be kindred. It's going to be great. Um, so without further ado, I am going to bring the handsome, the funny, the host of the US to America podcast, former consul for the British Empire. Can we say that anymore? Okay, we'll just call it Great Britain. Um, I, and, and somebody who I consider a personal friend, uh, Mr. Dan Rutstein. Welcome. Hi, how are you? Hello, hello, short Jennifer and long Beth. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, the joke is, Dan, you've never had the pleasure of meeting Beth, but um, the the height difference is about the same between you and me as it is between me and Beth. <laughs> so <laughs> for those that know us, so, how yeah, are you doing tonight? Um, see, that's the most difficult question you can <laughs> ask anybody at the moment. It's true. Um, but, you know, I'm broadly, I think, OK, which is as good as you'll get in 2020. So, yeah, mm -hmm. I'll take that. Sure. Yeah, well, I mean, your hair looks awesome, so there you go. <laughs> That's fine. I think I was, when I was watching the intro again, I realized, for those who remember the picture of me in the intro, I'm looking really miserable and sad. And that's not because I'm miserable and sad about being on this. Um, it's because when requesting a picture that can be cut beautifully to be part of your graphics, the only one I could find is one that was taken um, on the Game of Thrones throne at one of these publicity events that we all used to go to in the days when you're allowed to go to things. And I was trying to do my imposing, powerful, gravitas-like, you know, strong king throne face, as opposed to I'm excited to drink whiskey and wine face. I just, I love that you brought this up because I, I too was going to bring this up. I was like, so, so Dan sent me a, a very wonderful picture. And we also had a wonderful picture that we had taken together in an event and it was great. But I was like, no, I, I, I kind of need you sitting, you know, like some, some form of like three quarters sitting. Like, can you do that? And then, of course, I get the Game of Thrones. And, and I was, Dan, I was so tempted. I was so tempted to leave it in with all the pointy parts. Oh, <laughs> like, you should have. I just didn't quite know how to like amalgamate it into like the rest of the media. So I, I like, feel like I've been denied an experience personally. You, but you, you know, know what, Beth? Um, you're in the fam. So I'll send you the photo. OK, thank you. <laughs> I've, I've seen so I was gonna say, I've sat on that throne three times now. So twice in Austin um, at South by Southwest when they always do a big thing, which they call South by Southwesteros, which is their clever take on that. But the third time I sat on it randomly was in Seattle. Um, I used to visit regularly and we just finished a meeting with some senior people at would have been Amazon. Uh -huh. And they were doing some kind of cross promotion. And so I was walking out the building with the government trade minister and there was this throne and it didn't take much to get the minister on the throne um and then obviously we all took our turns i think that i was wearing a suit for that one so the, the picture you used isn't that one but yeah the, the throne has been to seattle it has and I, in fact i was in new york city when it first traveled there and i never got to see um the exhibition um i don't know okay so i i have to i have to pull us back for just a second for those of you who don't know dan Dan, can you tell us a little bit about why you were hanging out um, with the minister up in, in Seattle and a little bit about your prior life and how we met? Yeah, so I, I, um, I had two careers. Uh, so my first one, I was a sports journalist, which was brilliant. Um, and then I transitioned from a job as a sports journalist in Bermuda to joining the British government. And I worked there for a dozen years. And the last eight of those, I served overseas as a diplomat. And so I was responsible for sort of trade promotion and investment work to sort of help build the British economy. And a big part of that, and this is how I got to know lots of people who work in the whiskey world, is scotch is a hugely valuable part of the British economy. So as well as being an amazing drink you can share with people, it creates jobs and wealth in a part of Britain that is very important. So we used to do quite a lot of work with Scots. So we developed something which we used to call whiskey diplomacy, where we would hold whiskey tastings and bring in the people we wanted to do business with, whether it's business people or politicians, we'd share a drink, we'd talk about the things we wanted to promote on behalf of Britain and drink Scotch. And 
I started doing that and I met lots of fascinating people, had lots of fascinating conversations and I got drawn into this world of whiskey that I'm still in even though I'm no longer with the British government. <laughs> and I had the pleasure, um, I was introduced to, to Dan by our mutual and very dear friend David Laird and I've had the pleasure of going to uh, the consulate many times in LA and, and celebrating with them and, and supporting many of the events, everything from, uh, I think it's like great technology to, G to the GBX gala in San Francisco that I was with you at. Um, so it's been such an interesting world. And I had actually been trying prior to COVID to do some work up in Seattle with, with that version, uh, you know, or, or, your, or your team members up there. And, uh, and that kind of got sidelined, but it's always been such a, such a joyful partnership uh, to work with you. And um, we were also recently on a, a live cast uh, for um, Scott's Week. Yes, Scott's Week. Yes. Is that what it was? Yes. Yeah, so <laughs> the uh, Scottish International Business Week combined, and we want to- Yes, yes. So, so there's, just, there's just a lot of commonality here, but- um, Currently, uh, you know, I think we're, we're all noticing the podcast world is just exploding. I mean, it's just like, right? And a while back, I, I mean, I want to say this is almost two years ago now, Dan, you started a podcast called the U.S. of Dramerica. So that's Dram America, <laughs> yeah. which I think is kind of charming since you are, since you are not uh, originally an American. Um, and it's, it's almost like your version of This American Life, but, but with alcohol. <laughs> so what I love about it so much is that, um, and you and I have, I've had a couple conversations about this, is that, you know, wine, now Beth, correct me if I'm wrong, please. Wine is about romance. Wine is about indulgence. Wine is about the long sort of sensual conversation, right? The, the poetry of life, right? Whiskey is about big talk. No one ever has small talk over whiskey. They have big talk. They talk politics. They, they talk, um, you know, world events. They, they talk religion, right? It, I've never sat down with somebody to have a dram and we're like, tell me about the Kardashian. You know? Although I will just chime in. Uh, Churchill was drinking Paul Roger pretty much all day. There you go. There you go. And that's an I'm just going to throw it in there. No, I because in no way did I mean to diminish the wine conversation because I've had some pretty great conversations over wine. But I just I find that when you sit down to have a dram with somebody, it's like you you dig in, they really open up in a in a specific way. And I'm wondering, your podcast sort of advertises itself as a whiskey podcast that's not at all about whiskey. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, so look, you're entirely right. What you say about the importance of conversations you have during while drinking a whiskey. So for me, you know, while I was a diplomat, I met all sorts of fascinating people and had whiskies with them and talked about all sorts of things. And when I left government, I wanted to find a way of continuing that in a slightly more formalized way than just drinking whiskey with interesting people on my own. So, I, you know, we came up with the concept for the podcast and it, it, is, it is proved to be that. So we sit down and we don't talk about whiskey, even when we're doing it with whiskey ambassadors, we're not talking about how long whiskies are aged for or what the ABV is or what cask they're finished in. It's just talking to people. And, you know, it's like comedians in a car getting coffee, which isn't really about cars or coffee. It's about the conversation. It's just, it's that, but with something stronger. So we've just had interesting conversations with people. And what's been fascinating, so we're now 45 episodes into this. Oh my and gosh. It's been brilliant because I've reconnected with people. I've had longer conversations with people I already knew and more in-depth conversations with them. And to an extent, I've been meeting new people and having those conversations. And we've had real conversations. So I actually thought this would be a sort of comedy podcast. You know, you sort of get a bit drunk and have a chat with people. And some of the earlier episodes were a bit like that. But certainly since COVID, we moved up to weekly because we were doing this over Zoom. And we've done social justice, racism, women in sport, social justice in sport, men's mental health, mental health in general, women in whiskey. You know, you name the real serious topic, we've covered all of those, but still somehow in a, dare I say, slightly lighthearted way. And it's been, it's been, it's not, it's like my midlife crisis, but it was cheaper than getting a motorcycle. This is, I've, devoted so much time and passion to this and it's, it's worked because I've had interesting conversations with people and this isn't about listening numbers and sponsorships and so on it's about 
just talking to interesting people and other people enjoying those conversations. And it's, uh, I've, I've loved it and it's been great. And you are the only person, Jennifer, who's been on the podcast twice. It's because I talk so much, you can't fit me into one episode. <laughs> <laughs> Well, on that note, that's kind of an excellent segue. I think we've kind of come to the point of the long and the short of it where we actually get to enjoy the long and the short of it. And the irony is, despite our name, we always tend to start with the short of it. So we, we tend to start with the single malt that we're featuring. And I know, Dan, you have some in your hot little hand because I dropped off some in a socially distanced way with you. Um, and I also will say what I say every week. Uh, if you are watching at home, if you're watching this uh, posthumously, that's not the word I was going for, but post the live cast. <laughs> If you are a dead person and enjoyed last week's ghost episode, um, please uh, always, always know that we are adults of drinking age, safely in our homes, not planning on driving, and we are enjoying a wine selection and a whiskey selection, but we are enjoying it safely because that's very important. Please do so also on your end if you choose to imbibe. So I'm going to kick it off as I always do. The single malt that we are featuring tonight is the Dow. Oh. And my lights just blinked. I think the spirits heard me, my goodness. Um, the Dalmore Portwood. Now, you guys have heard me over five weeks talk again and again and again about our very special relationship, not only with Great Britain, but our very special relationship we have with Gonzalez Villas Bodega in Jerez de la Frontera and our access to these 30-year-old Methuselah Oloroso casks. That's a mouthful. This is the only Dalmore whiskey that is featured in our principal collection that does not have a single, single bit of that Methuselah Oloroso influence in the mix. And this is called Portwood because this beautiful whiskey is additionally matured in tawny port casks from Graham's, one of the most famous port makers in the world. Now, this is like last week, a no age statement whiskey. And I can't give like a really tight, age but this is going to be in those low 20s ish so i think a lot of times there's there's this idea that when people are trying a no age statement whiskey that it's a that it's a young whiskey or they're just trying to pull wool over your eyes this is not at all where we come from the idea behind this whiskey is to make the most exceptional no age statement whiskey in the world um also it's very rare in the dalmore collection because it's kind of a it's a high abv uh, Richard Patterson, our master blender, tends to, to keep stuff at a low ABV because he likes it a little bit more friendly. So a lot of our whiskeys are coming in right around 40 or just above. This is actually a 46.5. Now, Beth, I know that was not an easy whiskey to pair with because the, the concern we brought up a couple times is when you have a spirit that has this heft to it, it can really overshadow the wine. And, and we wanted to have you know, a whiskey and a wine that were in conversation with each other. Mm -hmm which kind of brings me to the point I always make about the Dalmar. So even though most of our single malts have this additional maturation, whatever that influence is, whether it's a, a one kind of sherry or another, whether it's a red wine in the case of the cigar malt, we always want that liquid to have a conversation with the whiskey. We are not looking for, uh, I guess in this case, a port bomb. Now, a lot of whiskeys, and, and one of my favorites that comes to mind immediately is like the Balvenie 21. Um, they use a ruby port. We use a tawny port. There is nothing good or bad about a ruby or a tawny port. It's just a different style of, ma of maturing the whiskey. And you're asking for a different thing to come out of that port. So the reason that Richard has decided to use a tawny port is he wants something that has a little bit of more of a nuttiness, a creaminess. It's a little bit softer and it has less bright fruit. A ruby port finished whiskey is going to have a lot of that bright fruit that's coming from the ruby port and it's going to absorb a lot of the color that's coming from the ruby port. But again, we want this whiskey to be in conversation. So this whiskey begins its life in ex-bourbon American oak, like all of the beautiful Dalmores that I have shown on the long and the short of it. And then it is split 50-50. 50% remains in the ex-bourbon American oak cask and 50% is additionally matured. And we do say additional maturation. It's longer than a finishing process in those tawny port pipes. And if you have ever seen a port pipe in your entire life, they are shaped like a cigar. So they're not short and fat like a hog's head and they're not really big like a sherry, but they are like a long, thin UFO cigar. They're very expensive and they are very hard to acquire. And the reason that we have access, just like we have access to Gonzalez Diaz, are these special relationships that Richard has made 
over 50 years in the industry. Now, the last thing that I will say about this before I hand the mic over to our long, tall sip is that I love to mix single malt into cocktails. And when I first started my career in the industry about 13 years ago, that was very controversial. You never mixed a single malt. As the years have gone on, people have gotten a lot more loose and fun about it. This particular whiskey from our collection, I believe is the best Dalmore to mix in a cocktail. The 46.5 gives it heft, it gives it body, it gives it elbows, it showcases itself. And I promise, because I have a little extra time tomorrow, this particular whiskey is featured in one of my favorite cocktails that was lovingly called the Tipsy Jenny. I did not name it that myself. Um, that is a very, very boozy cocktail that uh, works with Campari and Carpano Antica and Luxardo Cherry. Um, and you can see if you decide to make that cocktail, what I mean by using a single malt that has heft. Because when you're making a cocktail, honestly, you want to use the best ingredients. So why would you use bad whiskey? Why wouldn't you use some of the best single malt on planet earth? So that being said, Beth, I've said this to you every week. You have knocked it out of the ballpark. I've been sipping on this wine. I, I've started at the, it seems to be a tradition now. I sip on the wine when we start. I, I am so excited and I'm going to actually come up here and I'm going to spotlight your video. Here we go. There you are. So please tell us about this beautiful wine. So this is the Bronchia Il Blue. We both have the 2013. This is uh, an IGT from Toscana, so Tuscany, Italy. This, the reason why I paired this is that there is, I'm gonna use the word plush because I can't think of another word to use in the, the port wood that I really love. Um, that's why I wore the, the, the port velvet because there's, there's this, it's just plush. We'll keep Beth, it. I'm going to interrupt you for just one second. Would yeah. you just cover IGT from Toscana for those who are not familiar with the term? Yes, it's Indication, my Italian. I took Latin for four years, but not Italian. So excuse the, excuse the, excuse the, the clumsiness. So Indication Geogra Geographica Tipi Tipicia. Oh, God. Um, Tipicia. We'll keep it at that, Ugh, that's bad. Um, but basically it means in terms of the quality for Italian wine. So you have DOCG, which is the top tier, that's um, Amarone, De uh, you have uh, Manello, you have all of the, the top ex expressions, and then you have DOC, and then you have the IGT. The IGT came on the scene a couple de decades ago where wines that were trying to be made in, or that were being made in a modern style, didn't qualify for the DOC, the DOCG. So they went for the IGT and the IGT became a hot uh, commodity, if you will, because it, it somewhat um, meant that you were playing with the grapes that you're using and it was made in somewhat of a modern style. Bronchia is made in somewhat of a modern style. Um, that's why you have a very sleek label. So the winery itself was bought in 1981 um, by a Swiss couple that just fell in love with Tuscany. And in 1998, I believe their daughter Barbara took over. Um, so Barbara Woodmere is the, the winemaker. So you're playing with uh, Sangiovese. Um, in this particular expression, there's other grapes, but so they have the Chianti Classico and they have a whole range. So they're playing with traditional grapes, but also bringing in modern grapes as well. And by modern grapes, international grapes um, would be a better term. So you're thinking Cabernet Merlot. Uh, this particular expression is 70% Merlot, it's 25% Sangiovese, and then 5% Cabernet Sauvignon. So you have the plushness of the Merlot, just very silky fruit, blue, not quite the plum of the, the portwood. Um, and then you have the, that red cherry from the Sangiovese and a little bit of that acidity from the Sangiovese to kind of bring up that mid palate and into the finish. And then you have the Cabernet to the Cassis to round out the, the brightness of the Sangiovese. So there's a plushness to this wine that I really appreciated. And that's why I brought it to the table as the pairing. Um, it's gonna hold its own with the portwood because it is, you know, there's there's a little bit of alcohol there. All of the vineyards in Tuscany, they have three estates 
they're all south facing. They're all getting lots of sun. So a lot of ripe fruit um, and richness, um, silkiness to this particular expression that they, they have, the ill blue. So it's just, that's the ill blue in a nutshell. It's one of my favorite wines from their lineup. Um, and I love it with the portwood because I think even though the fruit set's a little bit different, they complement each other. It's the texture. Oh my God, I, I couldn't agree more. I, so again, <laughs> I, I, I want you to like own a winery. Like this is my wish for you. Like you just leisurely lie around and just like, and like make wine all day. Um, Cause that's what I think wine, wine people do. They just lay around and make wine all day. But uh, so it's fascinating. The, the Portwood is so well known for having these notes of blackberry and white pepper. And, uh, and Dan, I highly encourage you to do this. If you can do this with the two glasses that you have. I've become famous now for the two nostril sniff to bring them up together and then you switch them. You try not to drop all your glasses. But what has killed me or just 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 really um, excited me every week, Beth, is is these aromas. It's, it's like you started from this visceral, chewy aroma place and, and then everything just comes together on the palate. And it's also fascinating to me, the, the wine is very mid palate, um, but then it kind of bursts like, you know, sometimes with wine, they'll say that there's a juiciness at the end. There's almost like a burst of fruit. Uh, and, and then for the portwood, you're getting, you're getting a mid palate finish, but there's something about the wine that's like, Poof! and it's like forcing the portwood to live longer, you know, in the, in the throat. Um, but I think the conversation that I'm seeing right now is it's the blackberry. It is, it's just, just just resonating between the two choices. And um, I find this thrilling. Um, so D Mr. Rutstein, what do you think? Are you, in, are you sipping them together? How are you enjoying this? Because I know you were an aficionado of both wine and whiskey. Aficionado is a big word, but. <laughs> so first thing I have to say, and this is one of the revelations of moving into the world of doing this sort of thing, is the nicer the liquid, the less impressive the vessel in which it's delivered often. So, yes. um, and I'm, I'm not being unappreciative of the samples dropped at my door, but you know, it's sort of a medicine bottle and an olive oil bottle, um, <laughs> chain, maybe balsamic vinegar at a push, and, and containing the most extraordinary things. Um, and so I, I think the, the whiskey, so I've drunk quite a lot of Dalmore products. I've not had this one, although I've had Portwoods elsewhere, um, including Balveni ones. Um, and it's a, it's a beautiful flavor. Unfortunately, the sample size is sufficient that I am going to put some in a cocktail. I'm so um, sorry, Mike Pence's fly just flew into my, my face. <laughs> it's here. <laughs> Apologies. The, um, you know, it, it's, a, it's obviously, you can tell it's stronger than usual. Um, and it, it's, it's a great taste. And I think it's, um, I was actually quite against cocktails myself. I was very much a sort of drink my whiskey neat. But over the last six months where people have been forced to, I'm not going to say drink more, but drink differently. I've started making more cocktails. And um, I am going to, I mean, I, it would probably be better if you actually drop a whole bottle at my house so I can be <laughs> more experimental. But, <laughs> Um, I think I will try this in a cocktail of some kind because, um, you know, it'd be interesting to see how it holds up because I think it, it will. But it, equally, I'm quite enjoying drinking on its own. Now, as for the wine, so my, my normal drinking of wine is white. Um, I think because over the years, just places we've lived and wine we've drunk we've eaten a lot of sort of fish and chicken and it's been a lot of white wine we lived in germany where we drank a lot of german wine mm -hmm. and i used to quite like sweet wine lots of riesling and gewurztraminer um so i don't drink a lot of red wine and i think a lot of it's because i drink so much whiskey nowadays and when i say so much i mean a proportion of what i drink as opposed to drinking lots of whiskey um i drink much less wine than i used to i think and so when I drink wine, it's occasional and it's special. And this is an incredible red wine. I don't think I've actually had anything like it. I've drunk lots of sort of quite full bodied ones, sort of a good red wine with a steak, you know, venison steak, but 
this has got a sort of fruitiness to it that I don't really think I've had much of before and certainly not for a very long time. So Beth, what, what should I be eating with this? I think a venison steak would be amazing with this and the portwood. I mean, honestly, that was kind of the, the food pairing that I had in mind. Um, I think this like a venison steak with some, uh, some sort of uh, Bing cherry gastrique or a sauce, maybe throw in like, some blue cheese crumbles off to the side because I think that would be delicious because there's enough richness in the fruit to, to you know, counteract the richness of that cheese. Um, grilled steak, anything like grilled protein, I think that would be beautiful um, with the wine. I, I would also just drink it by itself. I think for those of you um, out there in vegan land too, you could do you could do like a like a seared jackfruit would probably stand up pretty well to this. Um, but you know, venison is very obviously traditional in Scotland, so like this is this is perfect. I mean, because if you can imagine, I because I have to imagine because I can't travel there. Uh, you know, sitting down at a very traditional Scottish dinner, the main course would typically be some venison course, whether it was venison liver, or whether it was you know venison you know um, steak or or, or um, grilled. Uh, so obviously both of these would be the perfect pairing to that mm. traditional Scottish meal. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just, I'm loving this because I, Dan, I have to, I have to say you are one of the first guests to really dig into the liquid mm -hmm. and it's, it's a pleasure because sometimes I, uh, you know, the goal of the show was to have people who have no, no, no finger in this world necessarily. And they're doing, they're doing other things. And that was part of, part of the shtick. But it is also a pleasure to have someone who, who really loves whiskey so much and really is aware of flavor. Um, I've also, it's been an interesting uh, a, a dichotomy to you that I decided to go on like a no white rosé orange wine diet for about four months now because of the sugar content, honestly. And uh, so it's been quite some time since I've been drinking any kind of non-red wine. And I will say, Beth, I think the, the lion's share of what you paired has been red. And I think part of that is because in the whiskey industry, we tend to, when, we, when we're talking about maturation, we're leaning towards red. So it's like the language is almost present. But you know, you did the most amazing pairing on our very first episode with a rosé, uh, which blew me away. I mean, do you, do you feel as, as someone with this expertise that, that red is, is kind of the feeling or the go-to when it comes to whiskey? I would say for the whiskeys that we have on the table. Now, if we were to pair, I mean, Shackleton is within our world as well, and it won't be here per se, um, but would I pair a red wine with that? Probably not. Yeah, that's a great call. I agree. Or, or um, one of the other whiskeys we make Tamdable in, I think red wine would just knock it out of the water. Um, it, it would definitely need something that was like be a heavier white. Uh, yeah, so I actually... We should send you a sample of that so you can see what you pair with. Okay. My, now, um, go ahead. I was going to say, my, so my appreciation for wine, I think, has changed dramatically in the last seven months. I think, well, a lot, obviously, a lot of things have changed. But <laughs> you know, as you sort of sit back, stop doing all the things you used to do, review what you know what you can do. There's lots of things I used to do that I'm not sure I would want to do again, even when they're safe to do so and go back to normal. But there's certain things I've realized I've missed more than I thought and are sort of very much on the bucket list. Um, I know some of these things you can do now, but we are we're, we're quite a conservative COVID family. You know, we haven't been to a bar or a restaurant since March, been to a shop once. So, you know, we're taking it all quite seriously. So even though you can do these things, I'm not going to do them until you can really do them properly. But in the old days, we used to have wine holidays so when i say the old days i don't just mean pre-covid i mean before children came along and ruined our lives we, <laughs> you know, we had wine holidays in germany australia you're, you're being recorded by the way <laughs> yeah, no, it's fine. they're not old enough to listen so it's fine um but um and we had you know wine holidays in america and there's something about wine holidays which is so special and it isn't just the wine you know it's the food it's the environment and in lockdown in May, we're lucky enough to have a friend who's got a vineyard in Paso Robles. And we went and locked ourselves down in a semi-empty vineyard in Paso Robles for a week. So we, you know, we went through the gates on a, I think it was on a Wednesday and didn't leave till the Tuesday. We brought our own food with us because we we're staying in the villa there. And just being 
in a winery at a, at a vineyard. Obviously, we drank quite a lot of wine, but we also walked through the vines, took the kids for walks every day, went Pokemon hunting, you know, through the vines. And it was such a, in, in the world that we're in at the moment, it was such a relaxing and, and special time. And it made me think, you know, A, I should drink more wine, which yeah, we did, and we obviously bought quite a lot while we were there. But also, you know, when life is back to normal, I want to have wine holidays again because that is something along with live sports and casinos things I've really <laughs> missed and I want to do a lot more of but I'm um, you know I think my yeah my, my feeling about wine has changed because it is special and it's you know the place that it comes from is the really special part of it um, and you know we can't enjoy that stuff at the moment and I want to again and this is another reminder of what we can't have at the moment you know I think I, I love that you said that because there's for me, wine always has a sense of place. And it's not, it's not that single malt doesn't, but, I, and I, I, I'm sure someone out in whiskey land is going to send me like a shitty email about this, but like, <laughs> I, I do, I will argue to the death that whiskey does not have to walk. It just doesn't. It, you can have genres, you can have regions where a, a style is, is common, but you don't have this. The only sense of place with single malt is Scotland. But when you talk about wine, the sense of place is, is micro, it is specific, it is Grand Cru, it is Tuscany, it is Santa Barbara, it, it is so specific. And, and it's almost like this, this luxury to drink the sense of place. And maybe, you know, maybe I stand corrected. Maybe wine is, is big talk. I apologize, Beth. I'm going to stand well, I mean, on this. <laughs> I, I think it can be. Um, I mean, I would have big talks over this wine. Yes. Um, it, you know, if you were to have a, a lighter wine, a, like a, you know, a, a, a sparkling wine, a Riesling, you know, maybe it would be lighter talk. I would pair heavier <laughs> conversations with this. But I'm I, just saying you would, you wouldn't maybe talk your deepest secrets over like silly girl rosé, <laughs> you know, no, in the lime no, green bottle. No, you know? it is 2020. So, you know, there's always exceptions. Fair, fair. But I will say that this wine even though it's IGT, excuse that horrible pronunciation earlier. I just, I, I'm so, I, I took German and Latin and Russian. So if it doesn't have harsh consonants, I'm not great. It's, it's okay, it's Beth, you suffered through my Spanish like for an hour and a half the other day, which was That's terrible. True, but I apologize to everyone. <laughs> it's far better than I. Um, I really feel that in, you know, in my profession, I, I've gone through the court of master sommeliers, I'm advanced and I, I blind taste wines and I'm prepping for the master som exam. When I go through this, I would still be like, okay, so it's not clearly like there's some Sangiovese, it's not hundred percent, but it still rings through and you smell it and it smells Italian. It's a sense of place. You're like, I yeah, agree. That is I agree. Italian. You're like, because I'm not quite... Sure, Back where? in my wine days, when I when I was I was dealing with a large scale portfolio, not to be named, but it was always very very obvious when you were dealing with California wines. I mean, you could you just immediately say, "Oh, I don't even know what this is," but it's absolutely a California wine. So I think you probably you have that talent in spades. It's just it's it's wonderful because I've always been well. I was an English lit major, so I'm always a little over poetic about things. And I, I think of wine as history in a bottle. And you could say that about scotch, you could say that about anything because it's an agricultural product that was made by a human with their hands. There's a story to be told. Uh, but with wine, you have you know, the different vintages, maybe you know, the terroir, uh, but it's this, this speaks to 2013 Tuscany. People are out there living their best life. Like, look at that, hello um making this beautiful wine for us they were living their best pre-covid life <laughs> <laughs> pre -COVID life, and they're still they're doing great today just you know from the winery the word is everyone's happy that's great oh thank goodness <laughs> so i'm actually um we're running a little bit long in the two tonight which i have no problem with because i love when we have guests like dan who are so thrilling um but dan i'm gonna actually kick it over to you because the, the, the third here always is that you're pairing um, and what you've decided to pair. And I do, I do have a video um, I kicked up for you, but I wanted to invite you to talk a little bit about what you've decided to pair tonight with the wine yeah. and the whiskey. 
So look, I love the fact that in, in a world where there's all sorts of, frankly, terrible content being made by people to try and fill this weird COVID void, the fact that you're doing pairings and you were very specific, I can't just come on and say, yes, I think it will go well with dark chocolate. You know, I think you've forced me to be a bit more elaborate with the pairing, which is why I've decided to pair these with uh, both a quote and a song. And I'm actually going to start with a quote, if I may, because I think this... This whole period and the way people are having their relationships with lots of things, but so frankly with, with alcohol, I think for me, this quote sums it up. And I've, I remember using this quote once in a speech. So I, in my old job, when I was a diplomat, I used to have to give a lot of speeches. I gave a couple of hundred speeches in, you know, sort of per four year posting, as it were. And I used this only once. And it was actually at my last ever whiskey tasting as a diplomat. And I gave this posting because I was feeling emotional. I had all the feelings that night. Um, and so uh, it works for me today. So it's from the well-known um, heavy literature, very gravitas, um, deep thinking Kung Fu Panda. And um, the quote said by an old um, tortoise is, there is a saying Yesterday is history. Tomorrow is a mystery. But today is a gift. That is why they call it the present. Now, obviously, it's only a kid's cartoon, but obviously there's a lot to it because it's so apt for today's world because, you know, this whole yesterday's history. I mean, I've had these conversations with people about, you know, the old life, and it is only eight months ago, but... I was talking to somebody the other day who was the last person I saw in a real bar. And, you know, we went to a bar. It was crowded. We had a drink. We ordered some shared food, you know, some buffalo cauliflower and some onion rings. And we picked at them. No gloves. Just, you know, hands in. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was busy and people bumped into each other and we drunk and we hugged and all that stuff. And it feels like such a long time ago. Um, and, you know, the life that I know you both will have led because of the sorts of jobs you have, you know, being in a, in a bar or a hotel or some kind of venue with 50 to 100 people, maybe more, you know, sharing an experience. It all feels so alien now. And it's amazing how quickly sort of it's, it is very much in, in the past. Now, it will come back at some point, but, it, you know, until everything is completely normal again, you know, no masks, no nothing, it will probably be two years. It might be three years. And so this whole, you know, yesterday's a history thing has meaning to it. Tomorrow being a mystery, it goes without saying. You know, I was, speaking, I was on a conference call the other day with somebody in New Zealand sitting in a full office as if nothing's happening because they've got you know, no cases at all. You know, somebody in Texas who's half locked down, but at least their kids are at school. And you know, we're in California. My kids are going to be at home for another seven months, probably. Um, you know, it is, who knows how this is going to play out and where it's going to play out differently. So we've no idea. So all we've got is now. And... If you think about the future, there is an element of anxiety which you experience, I think. You can't not. And somebody was saying to me the other day, anxiety is the least useful emotion because (laughs) you can't control it. And all you're doing is worrying about something that's going to happen. Um, But there is a lot of anxiety. But if you, you know, if you take the moments now, all right, you know, I really didn't think I'd ever spend 180 days all day, every day with my kids. Um, (laughs) Yeah. Eating, eating, I, just, I love the co- commentary by Beth. I will, I just I'm, I'm dying um, over here. But, you know, if you could, if you could sort of step back, you know, actually, it's a really special time, and there will never be another time like it. Um, sitting at home, you know, I say we're not going to bars and restaurants, but we've had two or three garden drinks. You know, we bought and we uh, reallocated our resource from Ubers and bar bills to garden furniture, and. People come and sit at the other end of our eight seat to, you know, extendable table and we share some takeaway food and a drink. And those moments are weirdly special. Mm-hmm. And um, so, the, you know, the, the present is so important at the moment. And yet I think we can't think about the past or the future. We've just got to take the moments. And, you know, the other day I had a bad day and I sat down and I opened a Balvenie 21 and sipped it. And just for 10 minutes... I forgot about everything that's gone on and will go on and just had that moment. And I think, 
you know, I'll be doing that with the remaining samples of these over the next couple of weeks. And I think just taking that time to enjoy something special at the moment is, is frankly all we've got. So we've got to make the most of the present. Oh, I so I decided at the behest of my best friend, Grace Bennett, to sign up for the happiness course um, on Coursera. And in the second class, they talk about one of the things that literally drives happiness is mindfulness, which seems very basic, but it's the mindfulness of the, you know, stepping into a hot shower and feeling the water on your skin or this, this, I, I, I was laughing because of your, your conversation, the, the $2 Ikea glass that I love so much because these flat bottoms, but like what it feels like in my hand, right? And the fact that the wine I'm drinking is still cool because I had it refrigerated to preserve it over these couple of weeks. And, and the idea that like, I can feel when my air conditioner comes on and just, be, just being mindful of the, the humanity of, this, of this, this corporeal body that I'm in and taking those moments that aren't about, you know, the election here in America or aren't about the pandemic or aren't about anything, watching the hummingbirds in my garden. Like that, that is something that is so visceral and immediate and present. And um, that really resonates with me. So, so thank you for bringing that quote. Um, I appreciate it. Yeah, and, you know, talking mindfulness, I've been, since I left government, I've been meditating using a, you know, using an app, but with Headspace, I've meditated pretty much every day with that for the last, I think it's three years now. And it, it makes such a difference. Um, although actually at the moment, the best part of it is my kids do it because there's a Headspace for kids. And, and Beth, you'll appreciate this because you have even more children than I do, but for six minutes, they're not allowed to talk or move. And it is quite a thing because they, they do it properly because, you know, we bribe them and tell them off and so on. But, <laughs> but still, you know, the, you know the, the 10 minutes a day I do it is special for all the reasons it's useful for me. But I'll tell you what, six minutes of your kids not doing anything um, <laughs> when you're with them, you know, as much as we have been, it is, it is worth the cost of the app just for those six minutes. Just, just putting it out there. No, and I, I mean, I take your pairing to heart. I actually pre-COVID would meditate a lot. And now that we're in it, I don't quite as much and I probably should. Um, but that being said, I mean, I'm very mindful and very grateful of this moment that we're sharing and that we're sharing some beautiful scotch, a beautiful wine, and we're getting to have a wonderful conversation. And um, I'm very grateful for this. Yeah, and me too. I mean, this has become like one of the highlights of my week. Mm -hmm. really. Truly. So it's, I mean, it is, it's being mindful and being grateful, like, okay, so the world is on fire and kind of crazy right now. Um, but we can still even virtually, you know, be at a bar top together or at a table together in the corner and we're sharing scotch and wine and just talking. And, you know, Dan, I'm meeting you for the first time, but this is great. Like you're, um, yeah, this is fantastic. Obviously, you know, massive plug for my podcast now, but that's the whole point of my podcast in a way. And actually, the you know, the first lockdown episode I did when I decided, so I wasn't sure whether to sort of pretend it wasn't happening. Um, and the first one I did, I recorded in my garage, you know, literally surrounded by toilet paper because that's where we were storing. You know, we didn't overhaul. You know, we're not those people, but we we had spare. Um, and, you know, I was sitting there with toilet roll around me and I had a conversation with Jennifer Wren. She came on the second time. And we sat there and one of the things we said is that it was about just having a conversation with people. And it was actually, you know, that was our first long conversation we'd ever had because we'd only met ephemerally at all these whiskey tastings. And it's a hug and a kiss um, on the cheek and, uh, you know, and a glass of whiskey. And then, you know, we actually had a long chat and then actually we've had quite a few long chats during this lockdown but our first one was recorded and i've had long interesting chats with lots of people over the last whatever it is now half a year and you know some of those conversations have been the highlights for me of lockdown because mm -hmm. it's a chance to sit down and talk and hopefully people listening have enjoyed it as well but frankly even if i haven't i have enjoyed that chance to take a moment forget what's going on enjoy a whiskey and talk to somebody about something important. And in that little bubble of, you know, Zooms and headphones and microphones and glasses of whiskey, it's been very special. So are we actually engaging each other? Maybe, I mean, 
in small ways, but virtually via, via this platform and podcasts where we're having actual conversations with each other that in the you know pre-COVID world that we weren't necessarily having because there was so much going on around us that we just didn't have that attention span. But are we having more uh, meaningful conversations now? I would say yes. So um, my best friend from school, who I haven't had any contact with for I don't know, 10 or 15 years, we got on a, a Zoom at the beginning of lockdown and had a three hour conversation, which was amazing. Um, I used to speak to my parents, maybe they're based in the UK. I used to speak to them maybe every 10 days. Uh, I'm speaking to, oh, I was speaking to them every day at one stage. I'm now probably three or four times a week but much more than usual. And the kids are interfacing with them more because we're trying to, you know, extend that grandparent time because we aren't going to be getting on a plane to the, to England anytime soon. Yeah. So I've, re I've recreated, I've sort of reconnected with lots of people, friends who I used to see in the pub I'm doing, you know, maybe every two weeks we're doing a happy hour drink. Mm -hmm. I've met people and walk around parks with them which is something I never used to do, but I'm now doing. So what I a pleasure. I mean, yeah. So I, I'm only doing this because of time. Um, I want to bring us into your second offering, Dan. Um, you, uh, you didn't only choose a poem, you also chose a song. Mm. And I want to make sure we get to it because I think it's important. And I want to apologize for anyone watching. This is the first time we've run this video, so we're, I'm hoping nothing falls apart or explodes. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and play it if you're not offended, and then we'll maybe come back to it afterwards. I, I have a feeling, uh, based on um, this incredible wine and the conversation we're having, we're going to run a hair long tonight, maybe 10 to 15 minutes, which I'm totally okay with. But I'm going to go ahead and run this video. So let's stop for a second, pause this incredible dialogue, and then, Dan, we're going to come back to why you chose this particular song, which I also resonate with. So give me just one second. I'm going to shut down my particular video.
Wow. Oh my gosh. That was, I can't please Dan. Look, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not going to cry to a song from the Lego movie, but <laughs> I, I can't remember exactly when it happened, but at some point, and Beth, you may well be the same on the rare occasions we're driving around at the moment, which is a lot less than usual. I'm stuck playing all sorts of stuff to keep the kids going. And this song came on, which I vaguely remember from once watching the movie in, in a cinema. You remember cinemas where mm -hmm. people used to I have no it? idea what you're talking about. Popcorn? Um, <laughs> uh, without gloves. And um, <laughs> you know, if, you, if you listen to the lyrics, obviously it helped the version you played, you know, it had them written down. Like that is my soundtrack to 2020 from March onwards. Mm. Because, um, you know, it is, I, I think you, told me in the pre-notes because it's not to swear but you know everything isn't very good at the moment um it is far from awesome but you know it's better if you stick together um i'll take not bad at the moment you know all of that like and it sounds silly and it is only a lego song but there is there if there was a song written for covid and somebody said this was written for you know covid i would have entirely believed them because everything is not awesome um and it won't be for a long time, but we've got to make the most of what we can. And frankly, at the moment, I'll take any version of Not Bad. Um, and that's why I wanted to pair that song with my global pandemic, but also with these drinks, because these are the moments in between where things are better. So that's it, and that shows it. I it's think not fair. A perfect pairing. Yes. Um, and it goes with the conversation we were having and it's appreciating this the small moment um we're all healthy we're all okay the kids are okay jenny your husband's okay yes you just got a house it's all like we have this one moment who knows what breaking news is going to drop tomorrow <laughs> you know but we have this moment and um appreciating that and i think that's a gift of 2020 um it's been excruciatingly hard and um uh, traumatic for so many, but when you can have a moment where you're just so grateful that, okay, you know, that moment, it matters. And I, it, it's, I, Dan, I swear, um, I knew having you on, on the live cast was going to be challenging because I knew that somehow you're going to, you're going to make me cry. And I, <laughs> uh, and it was, it was so close. I was, I was like, ah, but uh, I love to argue with you. Um, I think the Lego movies, uh, despite the fact they're Lego movies, um, have been, they're brilliant. The first one was very deep, it was, it was very deep. And um, it always makes me think of my friend, Grace Bennett. It's really funny, I mentioned her earlier in the live cast without meaning to, but she used to, there was a certain point in my life she called me President Business. And uh, she meant it as a, as a loving comment because she's, she's loving, but it didn't make me have to investigate myself and say, hmm, Am I not having any fun? Should I maybe step back a little and be less president business? You know, because I'm I'm always making things happen and being in charge. Uh, but no, I think that was a perfect pairing. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was it was ideal for the indulgence of Tuscany, the richness of a port finished single malt. It kind of just completed the trifecta, which is really what this show was about. Mm -hmm. It was about taking something that was. Um, delicious, indulgent, luxurious, but actually completing the trifecta with the human experience, whether that was art or dance or film or fashion or however it came about. And I think, you know, Dan, I told you my theme song this year, which uh, I'll try to put in the post notes, um, was uh, the Mountain Goats. <laughs> and Beth, you know the song, which is, I'm gonna make it through this year if it kills me. <laughs> and so far it hasn't killed me. I'm still hanging on really, really strong. And, you know, we've managed to make it to episode five of this weekly show. And I never knew, and, and like Dan, props to you because the US of America, creating the show that this is this ongoing thing that you have to make sure that you are, you are servicing and serving every week to be at the highest capability. Um, on that note, do you want to share with us any of your um, favorite episodes or upcoming guests that we could we could pay attention to for the US Inter America podcast? Obviously, I, as a former diplomat, uh, having had 44 guests on 45 episodes, um, I would never deign to pick a favorite, but 
obviously there are two starring Jennifer Wren, which are probably <laughs> worth listening to. But I, I think it. <laughs> the, the fun thing about interview based podcasts, I think, is you know, some people will come for the host, some people will come for the whiskey, but it's the guest. So, you know, the numbers fluctuate depending on the guests, and people, some people will listen to some and are not interested in the others. But some of it is because I just know lots of sort of slightly quite random people from lots of different walks of life but we have a real selection so we've got you know everything from uh, you know we've had some whiskey ambassadors we've had a, a British fighter pilot we've had um, movie sorry a TV guru Nigel Lithgow we had the actor who played Chunk in the, from the Goonies which was a particular property popular episode we had my, my good friend, the actress, Natalie Morales on. We had a former Obama advisor talking about what it's like being a black man in America. Uh, we had, um, there's a TV show in Britain called Gladiators, which is sort of lots of people fighting with normal humans. And we had Rhino from Gladiators is now an actor on there. Um, we had the CEO of BAFTA, the British Film and mm-hmm. Television Academy. So we had all sorts of people. I got, you know, we've got a great one coming up next week, actually, because a lot of these things actually end up being things I'm personally interested in. So we had the British Deputy High Commissioner to Ghana on the other day because my oh. wife's Ghanaian and I wanted to talk about Ghanaian food. But I'd rather like sports betting and we've had somebody who runs a sports betting company and next week we've got one of the leading horse handicappers in the America coming on to talk about horses. So I get an excuse to talk about gambling. So we've had a, a full range of interesting guests. You know, some you will have heard of, some you won't have, but the conversations are always light and interesting and about whiskey, and increasingly serious, but in a good way. Mm-hmm. Um, and actually, I think I might be inviting Beth Hickey, a well-known sommelier, on. Um, She's because... fantastic. I highly recommend her. <laughs> we haven't had any tall people and any people who are from the wine world. So maybe we can rectify two of those things in one in one podcast. Perfect. <laughs> Well, guys, um, we are long in the tooth tonight, so I am going to go ahead and I think close out for the evening as much as I could talk to these two. Well, we do need to mention. Yes, ma'am, please. If you're interested in purchasing Brancai, you can go to their website. You can also go to Drizzly, Total Wine, or support your local wine store. Uh, Go on your request if they don't have it, and most likely they'd be happy to special order it for you. Yeah, and I actually want to give a shout out. Um, Beth is part of an elite racehorse team called the Elevage Collection um, that, is, that is part of the Ian J. Gallo uh, portfolio. And you can, of course, go to Instagram as well and follow Elevage Collection. And they, you can have access to any of these wines. And they will, of course, respond. They respond to me instantly, which is crazy because I'm always tagging them in posts. Um, and then, of course, if you want to enjoy some of the Dalmore Portwood, you can go to, obviously, thedalmore.com. But you can go also to me, the Jennifer Wren, message me directly. I can always point you in the right direction. Um, And of course, for Dan, please, you can see to my, this way, it's always backwards on the screen, US of Dramerica podcast. It is, I I, I have so much love for this podcast, Dan. You have filled many hours of my COVID pandemic times. Um, So I'm going to go ahead and slowly but surely close out the night. Guys, thank you so much, Beth. You knocked it out of the park again. Dan, thank you so much for your contribution tonight. I have never watched the sequel to the Lego movie, so that was all new to me. It was a revelation. Thank you so much. Uh, So let's see. Okay, I'm going to begin closing. This is always weird because I'm like running technology and also um, talking to you at the same time. So that being said, um, I'm going to offer, before I go completely dark tonight. Let's see, there we go. I think we're closed out. Um, I am going to offer one of my favorite poems of all time. There was a, uh, when I was a child, my mother raised me on Shel Silverstein. And um, Shel Silverstein is a, is a bit edgy. Like he wrote for Playboy, he did a lot of stuff that was not uh, children oriented, but one of the best things about Shel Silverstein is he really captured, um, I, I think the human consciousness in a lot of amazing and beautiful and unique poetry. So recently there was a scandal. Oh, Beth, I see you're still on, I'm staring at your face. There was this whole scandal in whiskey where um, a celebrity I will not name invested in 
technology that is using expedited maturation. So what this means is they are using vacuum distillation and chemical compounds to uh, imitate multi-year maturation. So you're going to get a whiskey that might taste like it was matured for 15 years, but actually was created in the lab and like five minutes ago. And um, I have a lot of feelings about this. Like I, I, I feels like I'm, I'm feeling my feelings about this. And the the poem that came to mind, Beth, I will share with you before we close out tonight. Shel Silverstein. The saddest thing I ever did see was a woodpecker pecking on a plastic tree. He turned to me and friends said he, things ain't as sweet as they used to be. That's my final thought for tonight. On that note, Beth and I are coming back, not next week because we are moving and we are women that are movers and shakers. We are both coming back on um, October 29th. So we're gonna take a week off, come back at our usual time with some pretty serious whiskey. It's gonna be on point. Beth, I got a whole setup for this. It's going to be incredible. I got like a special like glorifier for the whiskey and I cannot wait to taste what you have chosen and I'm not gonna reveal it, it's a surprise, but have the most amazing night. Um, I cannot wait to spend another evening with you on the long and short of it in two weeks. So I will see you soon. And guys, good night, enjoy yourselves. I'm going to sign off. This is Jennifer Wren, episode five of The Long and Short of It.